All right, good morning, Rock Church, and Merry Christmas. <laughs> Who's ready to sing and praise and worship the Lord this morning? Give it all to Him. Let's do this. Yeah. 
we just Lord God, we're so grateful to you, Lord. And we lift your name on high this morning, Father. Because you, Lord. Thank you for listening to the message today. We would love for you to share in the comments how God is speaking to you through his word. If you would like to join our online church community, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon on our YouTube page so you're notified when we post a new weekly sermon. You can also learn more about The Rock Church by visiting our website, rockag.com. If you are in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, make sure to come visit us for Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. We would love to meet you in person. And if you would like to support this ministry today, you can donate by visiting our website and clicking the giving tab at the top of the page or by texting the amount you would like to give to the number 84321. Then follow the instructions in the text reply. Thanks again for joining us. We look forward to hearing from you. Merry Christmas. Welcome to this year's fun, family-friendly, interactive Christmas program. Keyword, interactive. Where you get the chance to come up and be a character in the Christmas story. Yeah, now, now don't worry, no lines to say, no songs to sing, no solos, nothing like that. Just come up when you're called and be a part of our living nativity. We'll call for you and you'll have that chance. Kids can come up, parents can come, adults can come, seniors can come, kids of all ages can come, everybody can participate. In fact, it'd be awesome by the end of the service if everybody was up here. Ooh, that'd be fun. Now, if you've never been Mary or Joseph, and you've always wanted to be, or any other character, here's your chance. So let me tell you who our characters are so you can plan now who you want to be for when they're called. So we will have Mary and Joseph. We're going to have animals that might have been in the stable. We're going to have angels. If you've never been an angel, here's your chance. Shepherds. Yeah, yeah, yes. And wise persons. Yeah, all right. Now, each of those have get a prop, too. Who? So then you'll remember, and so will everyone else, who you are. So again, like I said, the order will be called. There'll be a specific time for when you are to come up. And don't worry, when you're coming forward, we're all going to be singing one of our Christmas carols for the carol sing-along part, so it's not going to be like that awkward silence of walking forward. We're going to be singing anyway. So don't be shy. Just give it a try. So Joel and I will be up in front guiding people into their place so you can meet me at the manger, which is our title this year. So let's welcome our narrator today, our wonderful kids pastor, Pastor Steve. Welcome everyone to Bethlehem. Are you enjoying the weather? So let us open our eyes and ears and listen to the story of when Christ was born. Yes, I'm the kids pastor. Disorganized things are commonplace, so don't worry about that. And like uh, Pastor Jill said, if you want to be Mary, we can have 10 Marys up here. That's okay. Or 10 Josephs. We're only going to have one Jesus. It doesn't even have to be even, so it's okay. So if you want to be Mary or Joseph, now is your time to come forward.
Welcome to join along with the singing also. Mary and Joseph, a pitiful sight. So tired and dirty, they gave me a fright. Sickly or dying, what was the matter? A room in the inn? Impossible chatter. My rooms are all taken, not one empty bed. There will not be a room in all Bethlehem, I said. But their eyes told a story of hunger and need. I couldn't avoid them, so I tried a good deed. I cleaned up the stable. Rachel cooked up a meal. We helped all we could. At least, that's how I feel. For we noticed that Mary was expecting, and soon. So we prepared for delivery right under the moon. And at this time, our baby Jesus... Note the caption on the cradle, on the manger. And we are going to be singing Happy Birthday to Jesus. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear Jesus. Happy Birthday. The child came so quickly, his face seemed to light, as if God had shown God's presence so bright. Joseph said softly, it's Jesus, my friend. God sent him among us to bring to an end fear and hatred, darkness and sin. Instead, God gave light to let God's love in. So away in the manger, that's not what we're singing, but no crying he makes. <laughs> Jesus and, and Theo cried. Yes. Yes. Um, so if you want to be one of the animals, whether a goat, sheep, cow, donkey, we invite you to come up now. We've got a special, special part for you as we're going to be singing away in a manger.
My animals were calm, quieter than normal. They often were noisy and never too formal. They always were eating or else they were sleeping. The stable required continuous sweeping. But on Christmas night, they were strangely in awe at the sight of the babe and all that they saw. It's as if they were aware that God had just hushed them had fed and watered and carefully brushed them. They knew, I believe, that God had been able to work a miracle there in that stable. Now, if you want to be an angel, I mean, even if you aren't, you can come up and be an angel. <laughs> Now's your time. If you come forward right now, we're going to be singing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We don't often see angels in flight, but on the first Christmas, they lit up the night. They appeared to the shepherds, and boy, were they scared. Angels, cried one, will any lives be spared? Are they here to destroy us? Is our time on earth up? Have we seen our last day? Have we drank our last cup? But peace on earth, goodwill to all, was the angel's sweet song. That was their call. With a light show that dazzled all who did see, the angels hallelujahed and sang out with glee. To Bethlehem, shepherds, the angels directed to see Jesus, the Christ, whom God has perfected. Go worship the Lord and follow his ways, and you'll find Christmas joy for all of your days. So if you want to be a shepherd, we've got some shepherds. They're on their way up now. And as they're coming, we're going to be singing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. The shepherds, I told you, were scared and stunned. Too much hard work or too much hot sun. That's what they thought. That's how they explained. Perplexed and afraid, they loudly complained. But the angel's song calmed them, and then they believed. They rejoiced when they knew, and they were quite relieved. They went to the stable and worshiped the Lord. Then they left and began 
to share the good word. If you want to be a wise person, <laughs> some of you need it more than others. <laughs> We all have that dream, it's okay. But if you want to be a wise person, now is your time to come forward. <laughs> We're gonna be singing We Three Kings. The star that shone brightly led wise persons at night to Bethlehem's stable, to the manger's strange light. They came bearing gifts in worship and love, praising God for God's wonders from heaven above. The wise men were kings, and they knelt on my straw. It was the oddest of things that ever I saw. If kings bring him treasure, then maybe you too can worship with pleasure. The person of Jesus who came to us all, so worthy of praise, for he brings us God's call. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to God for healing from strife. Come unto me, all you who labor, and I'll give you rest forever to savor. As we focus on this mighty sight, let us remember by singing, Silent Night.
Twas the very first Christmas, and there in the manger, the Christ child was born. It couldn't have been stranger. Shepherds saw angels, wise men, a star. They came to see Jesus. They came from afar. They knew he was special, God's very own son. He came to the earth to love everyone. He grew up in time, the Savior, the Lord, to be worshipped each day, to be loved and adored. So now at Christmas, we all take delight in the gift that God gave us that first Christmas night, in the gifts we receive and the ones that we give. Let us never forget it's in Christ that we live. And just as the angels a message did bring. Let us lift up our voices. Joy to the world, we will sing. Pastor Dale is on his way up here. Thank you for all that helped with us, and you may go and have your seats. Give him a hand, yes. Good job. Hallelujah. Hey, let's give all the actors and actresses a big round of applause. And Caleb was the star of the show. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. That was fun. Hallelujah. You know, maybe we just need to do it again next year and expand on uh, what we did this year. That was fun. I want to read from Luke chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read the Christmas story. And it never gets old, does it? Christmas story and the Easter story. Neither one never gets old. Actually, God's word never gets old. But if you want to turn in your Bibles or read on the screens, from Luke 2, I want to read the Christmas story to the Rock Church. And then we get to have another Christmas service next week. Amen. So come. And let's be a part of what the Lord's doing. In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that took place while Quirinius, governor of Syria, and everyone went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea 
to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he longed, belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary. Can you all even imagine that? Who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her first, firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, swaddling clothes, some translations say. And placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them. And they were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy from all the people. Does the good news this morning, if you know Jesus Christ, cause great joy? I, I really did felt a special joy all through the worship and all that we're doing today. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, everybody say suddenly. <clears throat> a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel Praising God and saying, and I love this verse, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. You might want to know that the word favor there is a word for grace. Aren't you glad for the grace of Jesus Christ? When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, Theo, Jesus. I mean, Allison, how old's Theo? Did she take him to the cry room? But he, uh, I think he's two weeks old or is he three weeks? Man, was baby Jesus a good boy or what? I think even the real baby probably cried more than Theo cried. Anyway, so they hurried and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger when they had seen them. Can you imagine? When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. What a testimony, though, shepherd. I feel like, you know, farm boys. I'm a farm boy. And they just couldn't believe what they had seen. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. It's what the shepherds was told. It's what the prophets had written about. We'll be in Isaiah chapter 9. Next week we were in Isaiah chapter 7. Last week, that hundreds and hundreds of years before the Messiah came, God was telling His people, He's coming. And you know what? Can I add this? He has come and He's coming again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mary had been told and it happened. You know, we call the Easter program we did and the, or the Christmas program that we did and the Christmas story I just read was a picture of a nativity scene. Boy, it was an unusual nativity. But it was there before our very eyes. The nativity, the place of our Savior's birth. Not the Hilton. Although, I, you know, I enjoy... Camping and I enjoy the Hilton. I like them both. Some of y'all would rather always camp in the Hilton. I get it. <laughs> Amen. I see some of y'all clapping. <laughs> y'all don't understand us outdoors people. The nativity, the place of Jesus' birth. It was, in my lingo, it was a barn. And even many of you may have a beautiful picture of a stable 
Well, we raised two or 300 head of cattle and sometimes three or 400 head of pigs on three farms on a regular basis. And barns aren't pretty places. My dad taught me at an early age, and you know how they smell? He used to tell me when I walk in the barn, go, green gold. Some of y'all get that. It was a nasty place. Have any of you ever cleaned out a barn? Oh, there's a few. We did it with a front end loader, but you know, you had to take the pitchfork and get the rest out too. The rest. It was a nasty place. It was a place where the cattle were fed or the animals were fed. And Jesus was literally laid in a feeding trough. Manger is a pretty word for a feeding trough. I mean, God the Father who sent His Son could have had Jesus born anywhere. And He chose a barn. And I mean, we could speculate all day long uh, why He did that. But I believe there's a lot of symbolism in that. You know, the Scripture says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ came. He said He died for us, but He also came for us because He had to come to this earth before He died later for our sins. He was here about 30 some odd years, 31, 32 years. But He came on Christmas Day so that all of mankind would have a chance. What do you mean nativity? What do you mean barn? He came to sinners like us. Because even while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on a cross. And dirty, sin is a dirty thing, right? Do some of you remember who you were before Christ found you? The pain and the heartache and the sin. Aren't you glad the Savior is attracted to barns? Aren't you glad the Savior is attracted to the nativity scene of our heart and He was willing to come to pay a price for our sins that anybody that would uh, repent and confess their sins and invite Him into the barn of their life, He would cleanse our hearts, cleanse our lives, forgive us of all our dirty, nasty sin and make us like Him. And declare us righteous so that we can spend eternity with Almighty God in heaven someday. Thank you, Jesus. And you may be here this morning or watching online. You haven't ever gotten too far to be too far away for Jesus. You haven't done anything that's too bad that he can't forgive. Hallelujah. 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 And this morning, if you're here or online, he will meet you where you are. The good news of the gospel is you don't have to wait to get all cleaned up. You don't have to wait to get things right. Because our heart is just like that old barn and that old manger. And if you'll ask Jesus to come into your heart, he will come. And then he cleans us up later. He forgives us right away. You could leave here today and go to heaven. Before you leave here today, you could know you're going to heaven. And then he cleans us up. Man, I'm glad. I'm, look to your neighbor and said, you clean up pretty good. That's because Jesus always does a good job. In my, you know, I'm born and raised in Kentucky. Some of you don't know. Most of you do know. Uh, just about a year ago, a, a little community, Smith's Grove, just literally 20 minutes from where I was born and raised, Smith's Grove, Kentucky. It's a small town. It's not even a small town. It's a country store with about four churches at one intersection. <laughs> That's the truth. And I might add, they serve one of the best bologna sandwiches in the United States of America. 
and they slice it off. They did with a knife. They don't even put it on the slicer. You could, I love my bologna. You can have it sliced thin. You can have it sliced thick. You can put fixings on it. I mean, you can go straight up. You can go white bread and, or you can choose white bread or you can choose white bread. That's the only kind of bread they have there. <laughs> we didn't believe in all that other good bread you eat. I eat the good bread now, you know, the, what's good for you. But man, if you don't eat a bologna sandwich with white bread, you might be sinning. <laughs> If you're tasting mustard, you can put mustard on it. If you're tasting mayonnaise or Miracle Whip, whichever one, I mean, it's custom. And, and, and I was kind of a purist. It was mustard or Miracle Whip in the day, but you can even get a slice of tomato and a slice of onion, throw it on that bologna sandwich. Oh man, the nastier you make it, the better. <laughs> Smith's Grove, Kentucky made national news about a year ago Little spot in the road. Uh, the little Methodist church there always put out a nativity scene. And how do people go to churches? Well, the farmers come in from 20 miles around to go to those uh, little churches. And uh, this particular church for years had put up a nativity scene. And somebody stole the baby Jesus. Now, I don't know if we had a nativity out here in the big city of Scottsdale, somebody... Stole the, it would be a big, big enough deal if they stole it from us. But in Smith's Grove, it makes a county newspaper's front page. <laughs> they stole Jesus. And it made national, national news. We found out uh, that that particular year, and I don't know if that was reported, over 100 churches had experienced people stealing the baby Jesus. Now, I don't know why they did it. I, some were probably really mean about it, really trying to cause trouble or making a statement. Some might have been like Dale Gray might have been when he was 16 and would have stole the baby Jesus and put it on another church's front doorstep for fun. <laughs> and then confess it later and took it back. Kind of like the chili cook-off. It's, it's, it's orneriness, but it's good ornery. <laughs> ABC News said this. And they had just like a 30-second narrative on it. And they asked this question. What kind of person would steal the baby Jesus from a nativity scene? But the question for us this morning is what about your personal nativity? You know, earlier I was speaking to you if you're lost, but a lot of us in here have made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Oh, and He's so good. How is your personal nativity set doing? You notice something this morning is that the baby Jesus was in the center of the nativity. My question for us this morning is Jesus Christ. He's not a baby anymore, by the way. The scripture said he's at the right hand of the Father, standing and interceding for you and me. And if you've asked him in, Jesus wants to be the very center of your life. So my question to you this morning, is Jesus in the center of your life? Does everything in your life rotate around Jesus as the center? And life is good, and there's jobs, and there's careers, and there's family, and there's all these good things. But church, we got to make sure that even in the busyness of Christmas, but then that's always a message, but actually it's the busyness of life, not the negative things of life necessarily, but even the good things of life. Is Jesus your priority? That's part of the message of Christmas. 
You know, we cannot allow the things of the world, much less the ways of the world, steal our priority of making Jesus the center of our life. Keep Jesus a priority. Make sure not that he's just number one, but he's everything and he's all in all. How is your nativity? How is your heart this morning? How is your time in the Word? When Jesus is a priority in our heart, and I'm not making it a legalistic thing, please, because it's not a legalistic thing. Are you consistently opening God's Word, Jesus' Word to us? You see, Jesus, Jesus has to be a priority and the Word is for us. It's not something you have to do to be saved. But I tell you, in the culture we live in, we need to know what the truth is. And it's going to be very difficult to keep Jesus as a priority in our life if we're not consistently learning and growing and applying the Word of God in our life. Because there's a lot of messages and a lot of teachings that claim to be true out there and we can get mixed up more than ever pretty gone quick. Is that true? So have you allowed the enemy or the world to steal your time in the Word? How's your nativity? And I, I just have to say, there's so many lies now that we've got to know the truth and what's true. How's our prayer life? How's your nativity? And I'm not being legalistic and I'm not even preaching hard. We cannot allow the busyness of this life to steal our nativity to rip Jesus into second place or third place or fourth place. We cannot allow, and I hope you have great careers. I hope you have six-figure careers or self-fulfilling careers. All the good things of life God blesses us with, much less if you're not living for God this morning and, and you'll be able to before the day's out. But church, we cannot let the busyness of this life steal our prayer life. Even if it's for a few minutes. 15 minutes a day in the Word and 15 minutes in, in the Word and even prayer, if you could start with 15 minutes, that's multiple days a year spending time with Jesus so that you can walk into this world empowered by the Holy Spirit, knowing what the truth is and walking in the power of prayer. Some of the old timers used to say, one week without prayer makes one week. And I'm going to tell you, I've found that it to be true, even in my own life. Get up early, stay up late. The question is, is Jesus the center of your nativity? And I could, how about your commitment? How about your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ? How about your obedience how about your giving? I'm not going to do a teaching on tithing, but you're not any more committed than your giving. See, even in our world, all our stewardship revolves around tithes and missions first. And then we pay the bills and do all the other things. Because Jesus is the center of our life. Amen. Jesus is the center of the nativity. All our priorities and dreams and aspirations and hopes and futures should revolve around Him. And Jesus has a great future for us all. Can I get my second amen of the day? Amen. The angel said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace 
among those on whom His favor rests. Some translations say with whom He is well pleased. Aren't you glad if you know Jesus Christ as Savior? And especially when you make Him the priority in your life. On the, Hey, let me just say this to be teachable. Because, you know, it's, it's easy to lose priority. That's why you're always focusing and refocusing and spending time with God. I get busy and I come and go and Darla and I pass each other in the hallway and I'm a pastor working for God and all of a sudden Jesus said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Get me where I belong. So just to teach you, it's a lifetime of making sure He's first and foremost in everything. Because we want to be practical, don't we? If you're saved here this morning, don't you want to be a practicing, learning, growing disciple of the Lord? Of course we do. I know you do. That's one of the great qualities in your heart. But when we keep Jesus in the center of our nativity, I tell you, there's a grace and a favor that will begin to rest on your life. Now look, you're saved by grace through faith and justified in God's sight. But I'll tell you, when you make Jesus the center of your life, I'll tell you what, Things in your life happen, and you go to trials too, but good things happen in your life that are beyond your imagination. And thank God, because of the grace of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, we can spend eternity in heaven. But I tell you what, I'm glad down here we can walk with Him every day. We can get up with Him every day. We can go to bed with Him. We can go to work with Him. We can go to church with Him. Please bring Jesus to church. But don't let it be the only hour and a half, two hours of the week. And I'll tell you what, and you'll begin to sense the favor of God on your life. And, and you're, you're, you're giving and you're tithing. And all of a sudden, and some of you have testified, Pastor, we're going to have the best year financially we've ever had. And those are always the givers. That's always their testimony. Or all of a sudden you've been praying and something you've been praying for a week or a year or five years. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, Jesus answers prayer. Or you go to that job interview or you got three interviews and you don't know which one is which and all of a sudden the Lord begins to guide you and lead you and, and you take the job and you say yes and it was better than you thought it would ever be. And all of a sudden God starts opening doors. I'm telling you, walking with the favor of God on your life, one thing that's good is the Lord closes some doors for us. Hallelujah, glory to God. I'm so thankful. And sometimes I try to beat him down. And then he says, no, you're not going through that door. And because his favor and his grace is on our lives, you look back a year later and go, thank you, Jesus. I didn't walk through that door. That's the favor of God. I mean, left to our own. I mean, golly, I make enough mistakes walking with him. How many can I make without him? But it's not just the closed doors when the favor of Jesus Christ, oh, when you got him in the middle, when you love him with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, he's, your life revolves around him. Your finances, your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony revolves around him. Doors begin to open that you never dream. Friendships you'll have, future spouses you'll have, children and grandchildren you thought you'd never have. Finances beyond what you had planned. His favor rests on the people that keep him in the middle. Hallelujah. He's the Savior. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the provider. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the one that goes before you. He's the one that's got your back. He's the one that has a plan for your life. It's he, he, he. He, him, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Amen. That's who Jesus is. The world can or could take everything away from us. Well, the last couple of years, that's become a reality, hasn't it? It's chaotic. It's crazy. You don't know who to trust. Blah, 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 blah. We talk about it all the time. 
our brothers in Iran and China, and I talk about it from time to time. I mean, they're losing everything. The early church lost family, friends, and houses, and property, and I'm so thankful that that hasn't happened here or in our lives yet. Can you give God glory for that? We need to be gracious and understand. And a sovereign God has chose sovereignly to let us have the life we've had. Thank you, Jesus. It's beyond measure how good He is to us. That's who He is. But you know the world, the IRS can take more of your money. And Don't worry, I'm not going to get political. If I wait 10 seconds, I might. <laughs> I'm just on the side of the folks that share our core values those core values. But you know somebody could take my home today or I could lose my home. Lots of us, most everybody in this room in the last year, 18 months has lost a loved one. And most of them, some of them, if not all of them are in heaven. Thank you Jesus for the hope of heaven. But they've been taken from us for now. I have some dear friends, as you know, and that have been taken from this earth. And I still miss them. I still miss them. You could take our bank accounts, take our home. Could you even imagine your children being carried off? That's happening in countries, especially some of the African countries right now. The world may be able to take anything and everything from us, but when you got Jesus in the middle, the world can't take the Jesus in us. Amen. Nobody can steal Jesus from God's people. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. So everything that we are, and everything that we ever will be is because of Him. It's because of Him, church. But He's our priority. And He's our everything. Jesus is always and always will be the greatest Christmas gift of all. Amen. Hallelujah. Emmanuel God with us, the Savior, that came to the wretched man that I was without him in that dirty stable of my life and his shed blood and his presence makes it hallowed ground. Because wherever the presence of the Lord is, is hallowed and holy. Bow your heads with me. Lord, we thank you for Christmas. Lord, the older I get, the more I enjoy singing the Christmas songs. The message of Christmas is impactful. Not just in our life, but it impacted the whole world that Christmas day. And still there's more people on this earth that recognize Christmas than any other holiday. Even the unbelievers recognize Merry Christmas. So Lord, it's always good weekly to evaluate our priorities. It's always good Christmas, New Year's, there's these different holidays are times and gifts that you've given us so that we can renew our love for you and our focus for you and celebrate our love for you and the good blessings of God upon our life. And I pray for good blessings. Your mighty hand might rest upon the men, women, and children of the Rock Church, both here and out in the East Valley, and all the people they represent, all the people we represent. 
And I pray, Lord, that you would protect that nativity scene in our heart and that we would always keep you top, Jesus. I want to pray with every head bowed and then we'll sing a song and dismiss. If you are here and you need to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of your life, you need to experience forgiveness and cleansing and hope and heaven, would you slide your hand up and I'll pray for you this morning if you're here. I see that hand. Are there other hands? See that? You said, today I'm going to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. If you've raised your hand, I want you to follow me in a prayer of sincerity. And I want you all to help. So follow me because I want to do it for the folks at home. If you're at home, stand up from your sofa, your table, wherever you're at and say, yeah, I want to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. I want him to be Lord and Savior of my life. Maybe you've been away from God and you said, I want to make Jesus Savior. I've, I've let the world and sin steal ultimately your joy. Let's pray. And if you've raised your hand this morning, follow me in this prayer, please. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that you're the Savior. Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm asking you this morning to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse my heart and mind, and take the manure of my heart and cleanse it and clothe it with your righteousness. I'm inviting you in, Jesus. I'm inviting you in to be Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Several gave their heart to Christ this morning. Let me pray for over you and we'll sing a song of celebration. And All of you have people in your lives. All of us do. And when Darla and I came back to the Lord and got saved all those years ago in Florida, we were blessed to have been surrounded with several dozen people that had served God all their life. And there were young people, we were in our 20s in, in the church, and, uh, and God, there was a revival that took place there, and that's a story for another day, and a dozen of us were called to the ministry out of that young adult Bible study. The greatest privilege of all the wonderful things that happened to us in that church was that we were surrounded by dozens of faithful senior citizens that had walked faithfully with God all their life. And I've always been attracted to that even before I was saved because I always felt that people older and I knew a lot more than I did. <laughs> so even in a worldly way. And I, but they knew God. Jesus had been the center of their life for decade after decade after decade. And Darla and I became friends with so many, but we just wanted to go hang out. I mean, you just stood in their presence and something happened inside of you. Years of prayer, years of walking, years of service, years of commitment, years and years. And just faithful. And that's what I'm getting to. Just faithful, faithful. Doors, doors of the church open, they're there. Prayer meeting, they're there. A special need, they're there. Anything that had anything to do, and they had careers, and some were wealthy, and some were middle class, and some were just living on social security checks, but they were all the same in that they had been faithful to God for so long. They were all like pillars. And they had so much to offer us young people. 
I was thinking about them this week and I think I told somebody, I don't remember if it was men's breakfast, uh, Eric, that I was talking to you, but we were talking about those faithful people and you were talking about your grandma. We're sitting here today because of faithful people. And the challenge of Christmas and the challenge of the nativity today, and, and I told Eric, I said, I don't need to be rich. I don't need to be famous. Uh, I don't need things for me other than the normal needs. But when it's all said and done, I want to be faithful. And when Jesus, you make Jesus the center of your life, you have to choose to be faithful. But when you do, the results and the fruits and the blessings far outweigh any pain or sacrifice you had to make or go through. So going into this, into Christmas and next year, Jesus, by your grace and by a daily choosing of our own, we want to be faithful. Would you let that be your prayer this morning? And will you stand with me? Lord, we stand together by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, because Lord, given to my own intelligence or thought process sometimes, I need your grace every day. And Lord, I love this church. I love the men and women of God. They touch my hearts on a regular basis more than they know. But Lord, let the Rock Church, let us, the men, women, and the children, starts in the nursery even, God, let us be faithful to you. Give us a grace to be faithful and a determination to be faithful. And leave all the other things to you, our future, the, uh, all the things that we talk about, that we just put our life in your hands. And touch us today. Refocus today. Speak to us today. And Lord, I believe you're speaking to us in dozens of ways. Lord, I believe there are several people that are called here today that have kind of put that on hold. I pray you stir it back up within them again. Let them know you love them and that you still call them and you haven't changed their mind. I believe there's people standing this morning, Lord, that have been praying and praying and praying and they've given up hope. And I pray for a spark of hope today from the throne room of God to the faithful men and women of God of all ages, God. So I look around this church and there's young ones and older ones and in-between ones that are faithful. They love you, Jesus. And I pray this, Lord, before we sing this last song today, that you would grant the favor of God, that the favor of Jesus Christ would rest on these people and that they might be blessed from the very hand of God, their comings and their goings through the dark valleys and the high mountaintops, through every season of life and today, that the hand of the favor of God would rest on every man, woman, child and baby in the rock church. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, have a time of fellowship.